It's like, wow, I introduced discipline and removed punishment. Also, what I did was strengthen our connection so that I remove the need that I have to control my children. Welcome to the Kindling Fire. My name is Troy Mangum. God is preaching a sermon to the world through people's lives. People's experience, history, and testimonies all point to some amazing attribute of God that you too can experience. I interview revolutionaries, fire starters, and troublemakers. This podcast is here to be a voice of encouragement in your life. A voice that says with God you can and with God you will step into the abundant life. So let's get rolling. Today on the Kindling Fire, I have Seth Dahl on the show. Thank you, Seth, for joining. It's so good to be here. Thanks for having me. So we have a mutually hyper uh, tall, fun friend named Jeff Zhang, who runs a podcast yeah. called Dad Awesome. He he introduced me to Seth, and I'm I'm excited for this show. Yeah, Jeff is so. I just found out he's so tall, six seven. Yeah, I had no idea until. Because we've only met online. So good to know. He's going to be much taller than me when we meet in person. <laughs> so um, so thank you, Jeff, for the introduction. So I'm so excited about the show because, uh, you know, sometimes we have podcasts that really taps into the Father's heart. And this is one of these. Um, God cares about kids. Big yeah. time. And, uh, and we're going to be talking about spirit-led parenting. And, and Seth is the guy that God has just entrusted so much um, wisdom and experience with. Tell us a little about yourself and a little bit about your, your, your ministry uh, experience. Yeah. Um, well, right now I run a couple of different ministries. One is Seth Dahl Ministries, but that's where Spirit-Led Parenting is housed, is in there. I also run another ministry that creates social media content for churches and pastors and ministries. I got a family of, we have three kids, girl, boy, boy, 11, eight, and five, and um, we live on a little farm. So we have two cows, two horses, two dogs, a bunch of chickens, a bunch of bees, a garden, and a farm cat that keeps all the mice and birds in check. Um, so we do that. I did, I, I, I was at Bethel for 10 years in Redding, California. I was children's pastor there. So spent a lot of time working with kids, working with families. And before that, I was in New York City for four years doing um, Metro Ministries, which is Sidewalk Sunday School. So we did basically, you know, church out on the sidewalk, 20,000 kids a week we reached. We had 17 teams going out every day simultaneously and preaching three or f- three, four times a day, no problem. It, it was it was hectic and it was awesome. So been in children's ministry a long time, but after a while, I kind of realized like, oh, um, I've been traveling the world, helping children's churches, children's pastors, children's teams. And one day the Lord just kind of said to me, hey, you've missed the most important pastors of all. You have missed the parents and the parents are the first pastor and the home is the first church. So that's when we started kind of shifting gears, moving more from working in the churches with pastors. I still do that. A lot, like quite often actually, but more moving towards families and getting, getting what happens in the church and the home. The Lord told me, he said, if, if what happens in the church doesn't happen in the home, it's not Christianity because mm-hmm. it's, it's something we're doing, not someone we are. <clears throat> and so that's where I really was like, Oh, we've got to get this out of the building. We've got to get this into the home. This has to become yeah. a regular life thing every day. And so that's kind of my background. Before that, I was a drug addict, you know, but even before that, I was a kid that grew up in church, you know, broken home. My dad lived in a different state. So just me and my mom for quite a long time. And so, you know, just a lot of pain there, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of struggle and became a drug addict for a few years and was radically delivered. So ever since 2001, I have believed in the power of God. I believe Jesus was real. I did not believe that before. I just thought he was yeah stories in an old book and and he visited me and delivered me from drugs and dropped me into full-time ministry real fast yeah. and didn't even know what hit me but so you know I have a huge passion for for kids I'm like oh I was the kid that grew up in church you know some of the language I like to say is I was a kid that grew up knowing about God but didn't know God 
yeah. I knew the Bible, but I didn't know the author. And so, you know, everything I do now has that kind of like, oh, we want to raise kids who, no matter their circumstances, they can know God, they can experience God, they can find him, they can grow with him, and, and, and families create an environment where God is real, where God is present, not just where they're aware that God is yeah. present, not just, yeah. you know, yeah learning the old stories but actually yeah, so like, i the thing that just resonates so much uh with what you're saying is parents are the first pastor and the family yeah. is the church yeah and uh i mean that right there is so powerful and and from a biblical standpoint you cannot look at your children other than a gift from the lord yeah you know i mean the, the bible says they are a gift they are an entrustment Absolutely. and yeah. um and you've got to see in with eyes of faith um, what God had intended for those children to be in your church, in your family, yeah. as you as the yeah. parent. Um, and, and it's such a major investment. And I love God does it this way because sometimes he puts us in the deep water and we're like, Lord, I don't even know what I'm doing. He's like, yeah. but I trust you. Let's go. Yeah keep paddling yep. and so yep. so what tell me so a little bit of where i want to go with this is is like bringing what we consider to be church stuff into family life prophecy oh that's church stuff doesn't happen at the dinner table healing church stuff oh that doesn't happen in my family with my kids praying for each other you know other sort of you know bible teaching we talk about family devotionals um, or having family devotions, but how do you, you know, there's so much that we relegate to this other experience, to youth pastors, to other people that will lead our kids. All the yeah. while, the Lord is looking to us saying, what are you doing to yeah. engage your kids? So what, what yeah. would you say to some of that? Yeah, let me just run with a verse, another verse too. And yeah, I think, you know, just for that, the, the perspective it's of children being a gift, you know, I tell people a lot, I'm like, this is, this is where God expands our understanding of the new nature that he's given us and his nature within us, where it's like, wait a second, you just allowed me to create humans in my image. And so you've just allowed me to experience a part of your nature father that i couldn't actually experience before so like you know yeah we're trusted with these children these children are a gift and it's like man what a privilege what an honor to be able to create little humans and raise them and develop them and and work with them and you know another verse is psalm 127 4 it's one of my favorite verses it says children are like arrows in the hands of a warrior so you know when we have kids god's basically going hey these kids are a gift to you and you now experience what it's like to be me at a greater level because now you are a father now you are a mother now you have reproduced after your own kind and that's that's a beautiful thing but then in this verse he goes now you're also warriors i mean you were warriors before but i just gave you weapons that you couldn't see before that you didn't have before you know, we're really familiar with like the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit and stuff like that. But then the Lord goes, hey, your kids are arrows, which means your kids are the long range weapon of the spirit realm. You know, a lot of times we don't realize this as families. We don't realize I'm a warrior. My kids are arrows. And if I know how to use arrows properly and work with arrows properly, I can actually hit the enemy before he's in range of my sword. So the sword is a short, is a close range weapon. Like, like the the enemy has to be knocking on your door in order to pull out your sword, or you have to go hunt him down to use your sword where an arrow, you can hit him from 50 yards away. And he never even saw you, you can climb a tree and hit him with an arrow. So, you know, just in that context, I think this is what he's saying is like, Hey, your kids are a gift. They're also a weapon. They're a long range weapon. If you know how to work with your kids, the way I, I want you to as warriors, see yourself as warriors, see your kids as weapons, you can actually do damage to the enemy's world, unlike any generation before, because most, most generations haven't actually worked with our kids. We've just protected our kids. So some of the language I like to say is, 
you know, an arrow in the quiver, an arrow that never leaves the quiver is the same as having zero air arrows. You could have 10 arrows in your quiver, but if you never get them out and, and release them and never aim them and fire them out there, you, it's the same as just having no arrows. It's the same as not having any of those weapons at all. And so I think as parents, that's one thing we, we really want to pay attention to is like, how can I actually work together with my kids and and another thing that you said was like relegating it to the church or school or whatever you know i was in a sporting goods store one day looking in the arrows the section the archery section there's bows there's arrows there's all the stuff you know everything you need for like hunting with arrows and and archery and stuff and and the lord you know i, I grabbed a pack of three arrows and i realized like, like wow some machine made these arrows. I can take them to the counter right now. I can swipe my card and I can walk out of here with these perfectly straight arrows, razor sharp, ready to fly straight, ready to hit the mark. They're perfectly designed in some factory, in some machine. And all I got to do is swipe my card. And, and the Lord showed me, he's like, this is a lot of parents' mentality. If I get my kids in the right Sunday school and I swipe, I pay my tithe, they're going to design my children, shape my children, craft my children. Children, and I'm going to walk out of church with these kids that are going to fly straight and hit the mark. And it's the church's job. I just pay my tithe, maybe a little bit offering. It's the church's job to actually develop my children for me. And so I can go out and just release them into the world. Well, unfortunately, there weren't sporting goods stores when Psalm 127 4 was written. The archer, the warrior, probably had a huge part in shaping the branch picking yeah. the branch selecting the branch shaping the branch you know it's like hey this guy knows how to work with iron or stone let's let's have him develop the arrowhead i'll shape the the arrow oh this guy over here knows how to do the fletching and the feathers and all this stuff so so we work together but the archer has a huge part in actually shaping his arrow he can't just go I mean, at some point he could just go pick arrows up from, yeah, from the that's store. A good, that's a good analogy. I, I but, love the verse. It reminds me of the verse in Psalm 112. It said the children of the righteous will be mighty in the land. The children yeah. of the righteous, which means we're all righteous in Christ, will yeah. be mighty. Like when I claim that scripture and pray that scripture, I'm talking about socially mighty financially mighty physically mighty emotionally mentally, mighty, mentally yeah, emotionally. Mighty. every single aspect of their life will yep. be characterized by the might of the lord and yeah. and and again it comes back to this concept of god gave us a gift when he gave us our children they're not yeah. son of, it's a different mindset it's just like this gift is a an amazing powerful transforming gift for for not only your joy but for your growth for their growth their joy and ultimately for the ultimate goal of expanding the kingdom of god yeah. uh, we just have to really raise our eyes man we we have such a limited view it's just like oh my gosh this is stressing me out oh my gosh they you know put something in the vacuum cleaner i'm dying you know i'm so stressed yeah. just like yeah I raise your eyes, man. It's like, look at it from God's perspective. Exactly. So, yep. so you talk about spirit led parenting and, and, and the piece I want to hone in on is, is the spirit led part. Yeah. Um, a lot of times we don't equate that, you know, it's sort of like I've got my parenting responsibilities and then there's the spirit. <laughs> you know, yep. It's like other, it's a different category. How do yep. you marry those two together? We're like, how, what has God kind of shown you in that, in that space? I mean, you know, just practically, it's like I, you know, whenever something is going on or happening, I sort of just have this mindset of the Lord wants to help me. The Holy Spirit is with me. The Holy Spirit is for me. The Holy Spirit loves my family and has all the solutions that I need. So, you know, it's it's just in our everyday lives of, okay, you know, for example, one time my daughter was... Um, you know, she's, she wanted to go outside. She was really young. She wants to go outside and she is, um, op she's opened up the closet. She can see her coat. It's cold out. So she sees her coat. She wants to get her coat on. She wants me to get it down for her and take her outside. And she's just pointing at her coat and screaming at me. 
And I was going to go over there and say, hey, that's not how you that's not how you get what you want. Hey, that's not how you talk. And on my way over to her, I, I hear the Lord just he just gave me the idea. He just dropped it in my heart. So I knelt down. I looked her in the eyes and I said, hey, babe, how would you ask me for your jacket, for your coat? If you knew, I would say yes. And and she just looks at me and she goes, please. And I said, here, I wanted to get you your jacket. I wanted to go outside. And, you know, sometimes for me, it's like, oh, then it hits me like a ton of bricks. You know, the Lord says all his promises are yes and amen. And sometimes I become like the little child who's talking to God, praying to God in a way that's like, I don't think you actually want to give me this thing that you promised. So I'm trying to convince you or I'm yelling or I'm all in, you know, I'm totally in doubt of what you've said you wanted to do. But I need to have that mindset of like, you've already said yes, all your promises are yes and amen. How would I talk to you if I knew you were going to say yes? How would I pray? So that one moment for me where it's like, I'm on my way to do something, he drops an idea in my heart, it affects her, because it's like, oh, this is how I talk to my father, we got to keep in mind too, as well as parents, it's like, you know, most counseling with Christians is trying to undo what they believe about God, because of their parents. So like, hey, why do you believe God's not there for you? Because my parents were never there for me. Why do you believe God's going to punish you if you make a mistake? Well, because my dad would just beat me when I made a mistake. Why do you believe like God is, is, you know, whatever? It's usually what we believe about God comes from our parents a lot of times. And so in this context, it was like he was he was actually helping me build something in my daughter, not just for our relationship, but also for her relationship with God, where she's like, wait a second, how would I talk to God if I knew he would say yes? And so, you know, that's one example. I've got example after example of that, where it's kind of like, I'm on my way to do something and I hear the Holy Spirit, or he gives me an idea. And I just, I'm like, whoa, maybe I should just act on that. And I act on it. And I'm like, well, that was genius. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading me, for guiding me. So, you know, it's as simple as that, like, oh, the way we speak to our kids, the way we discipline our kids. Uh, Hey, you know, I ask my kids every day, like, do you guys have any dreams? You know, we've made decisions to move across the country at certain times. We've made timing decisions because of our children's dreams. So, you know, my daughter would say, well, I had this dream that I left school partway through the year and I was waving goodbye to my friends and we never went back. And I said, Hey, we were praying. Remember, we're praying about when to actually move from California to Texas. And and she's like, yeah, I said, I think God gave you the dream that we're supposed to leave at Christmas halfway through the year, not wait till the year is over. So we move. You know, of course, they're sad. Like I have to leave my friends partway through the year. So we move and COVID hits. And so we're like, hey, guys, guess what? Yeah. None of your friends are in school. None of your friends can see each other. California is in full on lockdown. So God gave you that dream to leave school partway through the year. And now all of your friends are on Zoom as well. All of your friends are not in school. You're not you wouldn't get to hang out with them anyway. And so you didn't actually miss anything. So, you know, we're looking for stuff like that. how is God talking to our kids? How's God talking yeah. to us? What's yeah. he, where's he guiding and directing, you know, and just having that mindset, like he's leading us all the time, you know, yeah. he's yeah. always yeah. available and ready. Well, let me respond to two things. So one, has God <clears throat> helped you in having wisdom in your disciplining? Has oh, he totally. ever changed something like uh, you would normally discipline this way that he says, yeah. do it that way. Uh, yeah, I guess yeah. your code example might be that, but do you have another example? Because I think that's oh, so totally. Cool. Yeah. So one, you know, one day when my daughter was younger as well, I'm trying to think of a more recent one. I have a recent one with our youngest kid, but the best example I have is probably um, my daughter was in the no fun chair, which is similar to timeout, but it's not for a certain amount of time. The no fun chair is like, hey, the way you're treating people in the house right now is no fun. So I'm going to have you sit in this chair as soon as you're ready. So it's not aiming for sit here for five minutes. And after five minutes, you come on out. No, you, I want you to sit here until you're ready to talk in a voice like this, or when you're ready to stop chucking Legos at other people's heads, 
come on out. So the goal of the no fun chair isn't for them to sit in there a certain amount of time. It's for them to regain composure of themselves, make a different decision, change their mind, and then, and then towards the behavior that they're doing and then come out whenever they're ready. So if my kids sit in there for 10 seconds, like dad, I'm ready to change. Okay, cool. I was aiming for repentance, not for a certain amount of time. Because, you know, if you like you repented after one minute and I made you sit there for 10, now you're in a worse condition with me because I'll, I'll get to this place in a second. But now you're in a worse place because I made you sit there for 10. I didn't make you sit there until you repented. So so as soon as you change, you can come on out. So she's in there, but she's melting down. She is like freaking out, screaming and yelling. And one of the tools that I learned was to say, Hey, can you calm down on your own or do you need a spanking to help you? So I'm, again, I'm walking over towards her to say, can you calm down on your own or do you need a spanking to help you? And as I'm walking up again, the Holy Spirit drops this idea in my head. So I kneel down, I look her in the eyes again, and I said, Hey, are you able to calm down by yourself or do you need me to hold you? And she said, I need you to hold me. I said, okay. So I get in the no fun chair with her. I sit her on my lap. I hold her and I help her regain composure of herself. And I realized, wow, I was on my way to offer a spanking. And instead I offered to hold her and she took me up on that offer. And now I, as her father are joining her in her consequence for her behavior I'm helping her regain composure. I'm helping her get to the place where she can repent. I'm, I'm leading her towards repentance with my hold, with my love, with my hug. And it was, you know, it's in that last second, the last second before I said, would you like a spanking? I said, would you like me to hold you basically? And she, and, and I realized like, wow, that's what God did with us. Like Jesus came and joined us in our consequences. Jesus came and joined us in our sin. He didn't, he didn't participate in our sin. He joined us in our sin. He, he joined us on the cross. He, he became the, he took the consequence for our sin. He took the punishment, the discipline for our sin on the cross. Like, wow, that's what he did. And that's what he just gave me as an idea was to join her in her consequence, to love her, to be good to her, to lead her towards the repentance I was looking for. And so, you know, for me, that, for me, that's the clear story. Cause like, I'm about to give her a swat on the bum and it instantly changes it with one idea. You yeah, know, same so, as my little guy. Yeah. So I, I can relate sorry. to that in the sense that I had a, so we had a structure in which discipline would happen and in, there would be something would happen and be like, all right, well, you know, it's kind of, this is what it's going to happen and we might spank him or whatever. And I remember the Lord would, would always, not always, but a lot of times redirect me saying it's not needed. Yeah. This isn't needed. There's repentance yeah. already and you don't have yeah. to bring forth a consequence just because that is the, how we do it. Um, yeah. Bring about that in state. And he would, would be very clear with me and a lot of times saying mercy. Now's the time for mercy. Come and, on. and, and yeah. that's where I believe that the art of spirit led parenting is, are you, are you running your house? Like as if you're a Pharisee of the law, or are you running your house as if you're listening to Holy Spirit and being able to be flexible, right? And be yeah. open to how he might guide you and, and, and the fruitfulness. Because at the end of the day, it's this sort of like, well, that sounds nice, but what's the result? Well, you, yeah. you gave testimony. I have testimony that my, I'm not crushing my kid's spirit. They're yeah. reconnecting with me in a healthy way. And the yeah. boundaries were, they, they, it was clear. There wasn't like, you know, we just said, oh yeah, whatever. It doesn't matter. But they repented. Exactly. There was a, a reconnection back with the kid and the child. And I think that's what God's after is that connection. Yeah, that's where, you know, the Bible says in First John, perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. So we've got to be really careful that we don't, you know, there's a massive difference between discipline and punishment. And a lot of times, like, you know, you can go over there and punish your children, but it, it introduces fear. And if God is perfect love and perfect love casts out fear, then to introduce that type of fear 
is to remove God from the scenario. But in, in the context that we're talking about, it's like, oh, I didn't, I didn't punish my daughter for her behavior. I disciplined my daughter for her behavior. The boundary was there, but I'm there with her. You know, you're offering mercy. It's like, wait, I'm disciplining. I'm actually training you and I'm helping you. I'm not just going, here's the spanking. Here's the correction. Here's the here's the tool I learned. Here's what I do. Figure it out. I'm like, I'm actually there teaching you. I'm guiding you. I'm directing you. I'm assisting you. I'm helping you. I'm your ever present help in time of need. Even when you have to get out of one mindset and behavior into another. And so, you know, in my mind, that's, that's huge. And what's the fruit? It's like, wow, I introduced discipline and removed punishment. Also, what I did was strengthen our connection so that I remove the need or the perceived need that I have to control my children. And I brought in the, the ability to influence her. So, you know, a lot of times what parents are thinking, like, here's just real fast, go back to the Garden of Eden. A lot of people think, a lot of parents think it's our job to control our kids and make them make the correct decisions. And it's like, you know, in the Garden of Eden, God goes, hey, don't eat that tree right there. Don't eat that tree. It's going to kill you. And then what did he do? He left the tree right there and he left the serpent in the garden. Like, wait, God, if, if God wanted to control us, he would have put the tree somewhere else. He would have put a concrete wall around it. He would have put it on the other side of the planet. He would have removed the devil. So the devil couldn't approach them. He would have kept, he would have protected them and controlled their environment. So there's no bad choices, no bad options. And so they can't do what he doesn't want them to do. But instead God goes, I want freedom, not control. I want influence, not control. And we get these two mixed up a lot, but God refuses to control them and allows them to make the very decision he doesn't want them to make. And then he introduces the consequence. Then he, you know, he has to remove them from the garden. Everything changes a, a whole bunch of, st there's consequences for their behavior, for their, their decisions. However, so keep that in mind is like, I, I don't, I, with that knowledge, I don't want, I, I don't want control. I want influence. Mm -hmm. And what that scenario did with me, with my daughter to join her in the no fun chair, to hold her, to help her regain composure of herself, to, to present the consequence. Hey, you got to sit in the no fun chair till your voice sounds like mine. till you're ready to talk like this till you're ready to treat everyone kind. You sit in the chair until then, but I'm going to join you. I'm going to help you. What am I doing? I'm, I'm, I'm establishing connection. I'm strengthening our connection. I'm strengthening our love. She knows I'm for her. She knows I'm with her. She knows she can't just get away with whatever she wants to get away with. She can't just treat people like garbage and get away with it. So she's, she knows there's a boundary, but she knows I'm with her. I'm connecting to her. And now I'm able to influence her and I don't have to control. I can have influence, yeah. which think about this in the later years. You know, what do we want from our kids? We want our kids to go, dad, hey, so- there's this boy that likes me and I, I don't know about him. Like, okay, well, tell me about your, tell me about this guy. Like, tell me, does he love Jesus? Is he kind? How does he treat his pet? How does he treat his mom? And I, we want our kids to call us and basically say, please influence me. Please influence me. Please influence me. Help me pick the car to buy. Help me choose the college to go to. Help me pick the boyfriend. Help me choose my, my husband, my, my wife. Help me. We want our kids to call us and go, please influence me. Please influence me. Please influence me. But if we create a culture where we've controlled our children their whole lives, here's what happens. This is what happened with me in my story is I didn't want anyone to control me. I was so tired of being controlled my whole life of having other people think for me, having other people make my decisions for me, having other people protect me from making bad decisions and learning through consequences. I had never learned anything the hard way, really. I mean, I hadn't put the two together yeah. when I did learn the hard way. I'd been controlled for most of my life thinking that was how, you know, that was what parents just had that mindset of like, you control your kids, you make sure they don't make the wrong decisions. And, and, and I come out of that and I go, you know, don't do drugs, don't do drugs. Where's the drugs? Give me the drugs. Give me as many as I can handle. Let me find them. Don't have sex before marriage. Okay. Let me find as many people as I can, many girls as I can have sex with them. Let me like, I, I, I actively 
attempted to pursue everything I was controlled not to pursue. Mm. You know, it's we call it rebellion. A lot of times it's not rebellion. It's kids begging for a little bit of freedom and a little bit of self-control. Where here's what here's what's really scary to me is when we have the mindset that we're supposed to control our children, we violate the Holy Spirit's work in their life. We actually prevent the Holy mm. Spirit's work in their life. Because what does he do? What's the fruit he produces? Self-control, not parent control. Not God control, yeah. self control. So we go, Holy Spirit, you can have my life. Jesus, you can have my life. And he goes, Here you go. Now I'm going to give you the ability to control you, to make your own decisions. You've actually been controlled by a long time from spirits, from fear, from, from, parents you've been controlled by society you've been controlled by what other people think about you and now i'm going to set you free from all of that and give you the ability to make your own decisions and as a parent if i control my kids instead of influence my kids through connection through relationship through love through my goodness if i control them i actually prevent the holy spirit from growing self-control in their life which is yeah. a really me, scary thing for me. Let yeah, me sorry, respond. that was a whole lot. No, it's so good. Let me that was like a brain down. It's very, very powerful. Um, so parents, God gave you your children and you think, okay, they got to act right. I'm a Christian. I know what's acting right. They need to act right. The goal is not your kids acting right. The yes. goal of your kids is growth. Yes. <clears throat> they, Learning, growth, they yeah. Learn, grow, uh, make the things that are true about God and life embedded into their soul. You will create what you're talking about is creating a false construct that looks like godliness but isn't, that has the exactly. appearance of godliness, uses scripture, but lacks its power. There's exactly. no power to overcome. There's no power that, that is by the Holy Spirit. And so you've yeah. tapped into something I don't think I've ever heard anybody say. And that is wow. really, you, you, you usurp the Holy Spirit when you try to control your kids because their, yeah. their, their, their growth, their goal, the goal that God has got in there is growth. And the thing that it just makes me appreciate my wife even more because I grew up in a do anything you want kind of environment. She grew up in yeah. a control environment and she yeah. kind of came to this beautiful place of like, you know, I want their faith to be real. And if that yeah. means they screw up, they screw up. But then I'm going to be there in love, communicating truth and how we can navigate from there. And I was yeah. on the side of, oh my gosh, they let me do anything I want. I've got to like lock this thing down because, oh my gosh, there's so much evil and awful in the world that I experienced. And I was overbearing and over yeah. restrictive and, and too much. And, and now, you know, I've, they've gone through the teen years. They're in their early 20s. Yeah, they screwed up. But you know what we did that, that wasn't lost in the screw ups? The connection. Yeah, we had a come on. Conversation about drugs and that they did. They, we had conversations about drinking that they did. We had conversations yeah. of repentance about stuff they went, did that went too far. And you know what? I have great connection with my kids. And I have no, I have no shame that they went and made mistakes because each one of them yeah. from them. And man, you just have tapped into something I've never heard anybody say before. Yeah. If you think about like, you know, think about it in the context of like learning how to walk. What would happen if parents were like, wait, oh my gosh don't no don't grab onto that coffee table your legs are too wobbly you're gonna fall and what if we protected our children from falling and we're like i don't want my kids to ever fall yeah. i don't want them to ever bump their knees i don't want them to ever land on their butt even though they have a nice comfy diaper on i don't want them you know I, and so i if i if i protected my kids from tr from failure from mistakes from messing up when it came to walking my kids would never walk yeah. Right. Like, yeah. no, they have to get up on stuff that scares us. They have to grab onto that couch and, and walk across. They have to try to go from the couch to the table and fall and maybe bonk their head. It's like, good thing they're soft and cushy right now because they're learning to make mistakes and get back up. Now, now, of course, we don't want our children to sin. Of course, we don't want our children to, to go just full on do evil. 
you know, we, we, no, we don't want that. No one wants that. But, but we've got to create a culture where mistakes, messing up, making their own decisions, and experiencing the consequences of those decisions helps them learn to think for themselves. You know, here's one thing. I'm, I talk with a lot of parents all over the place that they are so exhausted. And what, sometimes I have to tell them, like, the reason you're exhausted is because you're doing all your child's thinking for them and they don't have to think. And so they're, they, they have not expended any mental energy because you've done all their thinking for them. Yeah. You've told them what to do. You've told them what to say. You've told, you've not allowed them to mess up. Like one example I could do with my boys right now is like, you know, they're eight and five. So I go in there and I say at bedtime, and I'm like, Hey boys, I love you. You know, I do, we do all our stuff. We pray. We, we, we do a Bible story a lot of times. We, we tell a story a lot of times, whatever. We'd go through our evening routine. I tuck them in bed. I love you guys so much. Hey, you know, me and mom are going to be in our room. Your sister's still awake. <clears throat> you, I want you guys to stay in bed, but if you want to come out, that's totally fine. You can come out if you want, but if you come out, I have a job for you. You can go outside and scoop the dog poop. So I, 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 I'll let you come out. I'll let you make this choice. I don't want you to make. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to create a culture while they're young, where, where all the decisions are really, really safe. Right. So like, Hey, if you come out of bed at eight 30 at night, you're, you're free to do that, but there's something I have for you to do. So you are, we will go outside and you can scoop the poop. Now, can I just tell you, honestly, my little guy at five years old has only scooped the poop one time because it's all dark. It happened to be a little bit rainy and we're out there. I'm with him again. I'm with him in his consequence. I'm with him helping him because he was four at the time. I'm like, okay, this kid literally scooped the poop one time. And now, even though I tell him, son, you can come out of your room after I tuck you in bed, you're welcome to come out, but you'll have to scoop the poop. Guess what? He doesn't come out. Who's making the decision to not come out? Him. I'm not controlling him. I'm allowing him to do it. Why am I doing this? Because I want him to learn at four or five years old, you know, coming out of bed when it's bedtime means there's work for you to do, a consequence for you to do. You got to clean up poop from the yard. Now translate that to 17 years old, 18 years old, 19 years old. What do I want? I want him to go, you know what? There's a healthy time for bed. And if I go to bed at a healthy time and I wake up at a healthy time, I'm not late for work or I'm not late for school. So like, son, you know, you're welcome to stay up till four in the morning if you want. <clears throat> it just might mean your grades get bad or it just might mean you're late for work or it means you can't do a good job when you're at work. So you're welcome to stay up till four in the morning. But but are you sure you want to stay up till four in the morning? Because, you know, a few days like that and you go to work, what happens if you're late four or five days in a row? Well, I'll probably get fired. Do you want to get fired? No. Yeah. Do you want to be uh, trying falling asleep? So I'm so I'm trying to create it where they learn it while at while the while it's a while it's not high stakes, right? It's not high stakes environment. Okay, you got to scoop the poop, but but it becomes higher and higher stakes the older they get. So the more I can teach them this now while they're young, the more they're in position to make better decisions when they're old. And the reality is, like pretty soon you have to make these decisions without me. I'm not going to be there to go, oh, son, you came out of your bed. Let's go scoop the poop. I'm not going to be out there. I'm not going to be there. You're going to yeah. be in your own apartment. So I need to position you to make those decisions on your own when I'm not there to help you. And so, but that's, you know, you create, if, if you just control, control, control all the time, you don't come out of your room or you're in trouble, whatever. Like, oh, <clears throat> don't you know go to bed early well i want to stay up late okay i have to allow you to learn that the hard way but i've been letting you learn that the hard way your whole entire childhood so hopefully you can make those yeah, yeah. decisions quicker and better when you're older the one of the things i tell my my kids is you know i love you um and there's consequences uh you're going to go into a world that doesn't care yes and there'll be consequences and there's not going to be yes. some sort of this sort of like but I'm cute or I'm smart or I'm give me some slack. And it's just like, nope, you're fired. You're out. You're gone. You're off the yep. team. Um, yep. I don't really care. You're not my kid. <laughs> you yep. know, And so exactly. it's like, that's kind of how the world works. And 
and um, and you want to be able to. So I kind of give them that concept of, look, I love you, and I and part of the the reason why I'm creating boundaries around you is because I love you, because yeah. you have to respect that there are boundaries. You know, it's not just a free for all. Like God, God's kingdom has boundaries. So yes. hey, it's been so good to have you on the show. You've you gotten you have so much wisdom, and I hope that the parents that have heard this you know, really get capture, uh, no pun intended, the spirit of what you're saying. Uh, it, yeah. it translates differently, you know, based on the kid and how, what might be the best way to approach it. And God will help you per kid, you know, some yeah. need to be harsher, some are more sensitive, you know, yeah. you get all these differences yeah. God will help you, you know, Absolutely. I believe that. So if they want to find out more about, um, kind of your ministry or, or anything else you have to offer, where would they go? Well, my website is sethdahl.com and my Instagram, my Facebook is all Seth Dahl. I do have a free Facebook group called Spirit Led Parenting with Seth Dahl. So they can go on there. I'm quite active there. We have an amazing community that just helps each other and all of that. But my website, Facebook, Instagram, I'm, I'm most active on Instagram and that Facebook group. So yeah. I would say check check those out. And I do also do a podcast with called Coffee Kids and Crazy with a friend, <laughs> Brittany from, from Reading. So we do a podcast as well. So that's, you know, that's always there. Coffee Kids and Crazy. That's funny. Um, but yeah, that's, those are the places to find me. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I know the people that, that heard, you know, kind of what you had to offer are, are richer for it. So please go check them out. And thanks for coming on. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Troy. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the podcast. Hey, if you did like it, it would be really helpful if you want to send us a review over on iTunes. That would be really cool. And if you want to connect, go over to Instagram, search Troy Mangum or The Kindling Fire, and we can connect there, and that would be a great way to kind of stay in touch. I am doing a YouTube channel, so we do video formats of these podcasts, and we'd love to have you look there. Okay, guys, until next time, be awesome.